Good morning and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me this morning to introduce two medicine faculty members uh, who are going to do a tag team today. Uh, first, Eric Gomnitz. Uh, Eric received his BS in uh, biology here at the University of Wisconsin, went to the University of Kansas for four years uh, to get his medical degree, and then returned to Madison where he stayed ever since, undertaking residency uh, in internal medicine, fellowship in gastroenterology and hepatology, did a research fellowship in both geriatrics and gastroenterology, and then went on as an instructor and an assistant professor in our department. He now serves as associate professor of medicine in the division of gastroenterology and hepatology. He's program director for the GI and hepatology fellowship, and he's director of the motility unit at uh, the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics. He's published 19 refereed articles, written three book chapters, and uh, is currently funded as a co-investigator on an NIH grant uh, held by his uh, co-speaker today. Uh, he's very active as a clinician educator and a very well-respected educator at all levels, medical students through residents and fellows, and has even received uh, the honor as, as being named Educator of the Year by the uh, uh, GI and Hepatology Fellowship in 2011. I must say I'm shortchanging everybody's CV or both individuals' CV just because I want to get to their talk, so I limited their many honors to just one and I'd like to highlight that teaching award for Dr. Gomnitz. The second speaker is going to be Samir Mather. Uh, Samir um, graduated in uh, biochemistry from the University of Illinois and then undertook MD-PhD training at Northwestern. Uh, he then took his uh, residency at Loyola and then fellowship here in allergy and immunology and went on to join the faculty first as a clinical instructor and then as an assistant professor, and since 2013, he's been a tenured associate professor in the Division of Allergy, Pulmonary, and Critical Care, and he serves as chief of allergy for this VA hospital. He's uh, supported as a uh, PI for a core on the uh, eosinophil PPG held by Dr. Jarjour, and he is PI on an R21 grant that he uh, shares with uh, his co-investigator, Dr. Gomnitz. He's published over uh, 40 peer-reviewed uh, manuscripts and is likewise an active teacher. And the honor I will highlight for him is the University of Medicine Pusto Research Award for junior faculty that he received in 2010. Today, the two of them are going to be talking about an exciting area um, when their grand rounds entitled eosinophilic esophagitis advances in an evolving disease. First. Join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Gomnitz. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Page, for that very kind uh, introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, so Dr. Mather and I are going to speak on the, the topic of eosinophilic esophagitis, and I'll confess that uh, this morning I had somewhat of a deja vu as I was walking into this uh, auditorium. Uh, when I was a junior faculty 20 years ago, an esteemed esophagologist, uh, um, Dr. Walt Hogan, gave a, a talk about eosinophilic esophagitis. And at that time, he had introduced this as uh, a newly described rare disorder of the esophagus. So it is a truly an honor for me now to be giving uh, the follow-up talk uh, two decades later. So I know that uh, many of you in the audience have not, not had the opportunity, at least knowingly, to take care of patients with the eosinophilic esophagitis. So I wanted to start with a rather dramatic image. So this is an endoscopic image of an esophagus with a meat impaction in the distal end. And what I see here is an esophageal mucosa that is edematous. There are concentric rings. Uh, there are mucosal defects the lumen of the esophagus is narrowed, at least narrowed uh, to the point that this meat uh, cannot pass through. We know that food bolus impactions are increasing. And in fact, I recalled when I was a fellow, I'd just seen a handful of these food bolus impactions that I was involved with uh, disimpaction of. Uh, compared to about a year ago, a fellow and I 
uh, one night on call, had four food impactions simultaneously, three hospitals, Sunday night after 9 o'clock p.m. So uh, again, in my own experience, this is uh, truly uh, how it has progressed. Uh, this requires urgent endoscopy. So we remove these food bolus impactions either in the emergency room, in the endoscopy unit, sometimes in the operating room with general anesthesia. And it causes significant distress to the patient, discomfort. They have trouble tolerating their secretions if they have a food bolus impacting and obstructing their distal esophagus. They're at risk for aspiration. The most common cause is eosinophilic esophagitis. So the epidemiology of food bolus impactions has changed over the years, and I think this is a nice uh, diagram of that. So this is a study out of Australia. Uh, they looked at the 15-year time frame from 1996 to 2010. Now, the first descriptions of eosinophilic esophagitis was in 1995, so this is approximately when that was first being described. They broke uh, their time frame into five-year increments, and you can see with uh, the lightest five-year increment uh, with the light-colored column and the most recent five-year increment with the darkest column, you can see that of all the causes of food uh, bolus uh, impaction, there's been truly a reduction in the acid-related strictures and uh, the acid-related uh, Schatzky rings. Now, this probably in part reflects the fact that the proton pump inhibitor uh, came to market in 1989, and then it was made available in 2001. At the same time, you can see that there's an increase in eosinophilic esophagitis. We know that uh, when we look at absolute numbers in this study, they had a threefold increase amongst those uh, uh, five-year increments from um, the initial increment up to 2010, and when you compare 1996 to 2010, there was a tenfold increase in the occurrence of food bolus impactions at this hospital. I think the same has been true for us here at UW. I've got a fellow that's looking at this uh, for us now as well. We know that food bolus impactions are, uh, the etiology is eosinophilic esophagitis in about 60% of the cases. And we know that in general, the incidence and the prevalence of eosinophilic esophagitis is increasing. Now, uh, with a prevalence of about one in a thousand, that is matching what we know for one of the other inflammatory fibrostatic diseases, and that being Crohn's disease. So again, it's becoming uh, uh, quite uh, prevalent. Well, eosinophilic esophagitis, and I will refer to it as EOE from now on, was first described, as I said, in 1995. And the first clinical pathological definition uh, was in 2007 when the ACG published this. So eosinophilic esophagitis is a chronic immune antigen-mediated esophageal disease characterized both by esophageal dysfunction symptoms and histologically by eosinophil predominant inflammation. Now there are secondary criteria. Uh, so first of all, uh, the mucosal eosinophilia is limited to the esophagus, so it doesn't include the other areas of the GI tract. Secondary causes have also been considered and ruled out. And then mucosal eosinophilia persists after a PPI trial. So when they first described this uh, in uh, 2007, this was to eliminate those patients who also had uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And now in 2013, we know that the PPI trial is to define a subset of VOE called PPI responsive EE, which we'll speak on uh, later on in the talk. So as I mentioned, EOE is defined as a chronic immune antigen-mediated disorder. There's good evidence that this is hypersensitivity. So first of all, early on in the description of this disease, uh, which was mostly in the pediatric population, they noticed that there was a lot of overlap uh, in these kids who had feeding disorders and esophageal symptoms, uh, and they had a, a significant allergies, including food allergies. They subsequently tried treating these patients with steroids, also with elemental diets, and found that they had symptomatic, endoscopic, and histologic improvement. We also know that once we have determined what uh, an EOE trigger is in a patient, if we reintroduce uh, those food triggers, that we can reinduce the uh, inflammation of the esophagus. We've also shown that uh, environmental allergies also worsen the inflammation in the esophageal uh, damage. And this has also been shown in a mouse model that we can trigger these esophageal changes with inhaled antigens. Well, the clinical profile of EOE is fairly classic. 
usually young men, uh, three to one over women, Caucasian, uh, young, uh, 35 to 45 year olds. Over 50% will have other atopic diseases and close to 50% will have other family members that also have eosinophilic esophagitis. Now one of the interesting things uh, uh, that we notice clinically is that there is a diagnostic delay in making the diagnosis. So over a five year delay in making the diagnosis from when these patients first report having had symptoms. And that's really due to two factors. First of all, adaptive behaviors. Now, when patients, our adult patients, have uh, dysphagia, of course, they learn that there are certain food consistencies that are going to give them problems. So they start avoiding these foods. They'll change uh, the modification of the consistency, choose to eat soups instead of uh, meats, uh, avoid dry foods, that sort of thing. They will also slow down their eating. They will cut their food better. Uh, they will chew it thoroughly and alternate liquids and solids. So again, they've learned to cope. The other factor is that the symptoms are often nonspecific. So I think that especially in childhood, uh, these are misinterpreted as being just reflux. And then uh, again with uh, adults, uh, they'll have symptoms uh, that they have learned uh, to get by and they may be treating their reflux just with over-the-counter medications. So it's turned out that it's been difficult to just use symptoms as a marker for diagnosis to monitor disease activity or treatment response. Now this is the spectrum of symptoms that we see with eosinophilic esophagitis plotted against age. And there have been two phenotypes really that have emerged. And the first is that of the pediatric phenotype. And kids typically will present with feeding disorders, esophageal symptoms, vomiting, regurgitation, epigastric pain. And again, this is often misinterpreted as being gastroesophageal reflux. The second phenotype is that of the adults. So adults, by and large, present with dysphagia. In fact, 97% of adults with EOE will have dysphagia. Up to 50% will actually have history of food bolus impactions. Well, the first time that we generally will see these patients in the clinic uh, is in the endoscopy unit. And I just wanted to orient everyone uh, with uh, what a normal esophagus looks like on endoscopy. So here I see an esophagus that is nice and pink and smooth and healthy. Uh, we've got a good vascular pattern there. It's got a normal diameter of approximately three centimeters. Well, we've uh, come adept at recognizing uh, esophaguses that we are suspicious for eosinophilic esophagitis. So in um, picture A, uh, we see that uh, this is a, a ringed esophagus. And when I was a fellow, we would occasionally see this. This is the case where all the other fellows would come running into the endoscopy uh, suite to take a look at these findings. And we would sign this off as congenital esophageal rings. In picture B, we see uh, linear furrows, which are features that uh, suggest that there is edema and swelling in the esophagus. In picture C, we have uh, white spots, which are eosinophilic abscesses. And then in picture D, similar to my first image, we see that this is sequential rings, we have a narrowed lumen of the esophagus, and we have a food bolus impaction there. Well, not every patient has all these features of eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, in fact, furrows are the most common feature that we'll see. Three quarters of the patients will have these linear furrows. 50% will have rings, and perhaps the most striking is that there are some patients that have completely normal appearing esophaguses. So we know that we need to biopsy even a normal appearing esophagus, especially if it's in a young male who comes in with dysphagia. Um, a colleague of ours uh, at Northwestern, Dr. Hirano, has developed an endoscopic uh, reference scoring system where, again, all of uh, the features are described in the esophagus, and this allows us to monitor uh, the patient's um, disease state and whether uh, we are having uh, improvement uh, with treatment. Uh, this is a study out of Switzerland. Uh, there's a large uh, group that's interested in uh, EOE, and there's a Swiss database. And they looked at the mean age of one patient's presented uh, with eosinophilic esophagitis, and they plotted it here against uh, all the features of eosinophilic esophagitis. And again, two phenotypes have emerged. So first of all, with our pediatric uh, younger patients, we see inflammatory features. And these features would include the white plaques. These are the eosinophilic abscesses. 
nonspecific erythema and esophagitis, and the linear furrows. And again, these represent inflammatory features. In our adult population, we see more of the fibrotic features at presentation, and these would include these concentric fixed rings, the esophageal strictures, the luminal narrowing of the esophagus, and then crepe paper uh, changes in the epithelium. They also looked at duration, and they found that for every decade of untreated eosinophilic esophagitis, there was a doubling of the odds at having a stricture. They found that uh, the age at which uh, most patients were having their first stricture, uh, the mean was at 35 years. So again, these are features uh, of um, advancing uh, fibrostenosis. So a conceptual model of EOE has really emerged, and that is uh, one of uh, persistence and of progression. So we have initially a patient uh, early on, be it in childhood, who has acute inflammation uh, triggered by an antigen exposure. Uh, we see this endoscopically by inflammatory changes such as white uh, spots, uh, furrows, uh, edema of the esophagus. Uh, with uncontrolled persistence of this inflammation, the development of chronic inflammation, uh, collagen fibers start to be laid down within the lamina propria. Endoscopically, we'll see these changes as fixed rings, and then these patients will start uh, reporting that they're having dysphagia. Now, with unchecked chronic inflammation, there's increase in fibrosis, and again, these patients will have uh, more trouble with these uh, narrowings within their esophagus these fixed rings and these fixed strictures. So again, one of a continuum and one of progression. Well, as we said in our definition, uh, not only do they have to, patients have to have uh, esophageal symptoms, but it's required that they have esophageal eosinophilia. Now, eosinophils are common throughout the uh, intestinal tract and the mucosa, but it varies depending on the organ site. So the esophagus has relatively few numbers of eosinophils within the mucosa. In fact, a normal range is uh, uh, zero to five eosinophils per high power field. Now this is different from downstream, for instance, in the colon, which might have 20 to 30 eosinophils per high power field. So the differential diagnosis for esophageal eosinophilia, uh, by and large, the two most common is the eosinophilic esophagitis and also gastroesophageal reflux disease. The rest of the differential includes other inflammatory conditions of the GI tract, um, motility disorders, and autoimmune disorders. But again, by and large, uh, when we find eosinophils in the mucosa of the esophagus, the differential mainly is that of EOE and GERD. Now, historically, it had been suggested that EOE had higher numbers of eosinophils and GERD lower numbers, but this is uh, proven not to be the, the case. Well, when we see uh, patients for esophageal symptoms in the clinic, it used to be so easy because we used to define uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease as erosive esophagitis. And this is an endoscopic image uh, of a patient who has ulcerative esophagitis due to acid reflux disease. Since proton pump inhibitors have uh, been introduced, we rarely see this, okay? In fact, we recognize that there is a non-erosive reflux disease, and in fact, now that we are considering patients with esophageal symptoms uh, to have uh, the possibility of eosinophilic esophagitis, at times we're having a difficult uh, time distinguishing between EOE and gastroesophageal reflux disease. You can see that many of these features with uh, furrows and rings and edema are seen in both these patients. So difficult to distinguish. And in fact, uh, when we study numbers of eosinophils, uh, and we look at the peak numbers comparing EOE to gastroesophageal reflux disease, there's been no difference. So you can't rely just on that number of eosinophils uh, that we see in our biopsies. Well, the pathologists have tried to help us out with regards to differentiating between gastroesophageal reflux disease and eosinophilic esophagitis. And in fact, this is a paper uh, with Margaret Collins, who has an um, interest uh, in eosinophilic esophagitis. And they have increased uh, the, um, uh, bolstered their uh, comparison of, of EOE and gastroesophageal reflux disease by adding seven additional features to try to di distinguish between these two. The unfortunate thing is all of these other features are also nonspecific. I think the most accepted uh, criteria, however, has been the eosinophil density, uh, 
And again, this means that the pathologist will need to count the number of eosinophils seen on the high power field. And in our pathology report, then they will list these. Well, this is the suggested algorithm of management of eosinophilic esophagitis. This was published uh, by the ACG in 2013. So once a patient presents with esophageal symptoms and they have been found to have increased eosinophils uh, per high power field, then these patients are suspected of having eosinophilic esophagitis. We place them on a high dose proton pump inhibitor for eight weeks and then we repeat the uh, endoscopy with biopsy after those eight weeks. At that time, if the symptoms have uh, relieved and they have normalized their histology, shown mucosal healing, then these patients are deemed to have had a PPI response. Now we know that some of these patients uh, probably had some GERD, but this also defines that other subtype that I alluded to known as PPI responsive EE. Alternatively, if these patients do not uh, experience symptomatic improvement and they have persistence of the inflammation greater than 15 EOs per high power field, then they are deemed an immunogenic eosinophilic esophagitis patient and they will be offered what we consider the first line therapy of topical steroids or dietary therapy. They'll be placed on this treatment for eight weeks and then we repeat the endoscopy with biopsies again to see if we've had uh, endoscopic and histologic improvement. If the patients improve, then we will consider them, uh, uh, again, to eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, we will offer them maintenance therapy, and I'll have that discussion as far as which one would be likely for them to be most compliant uh, down the road with. Alternatively, uh, if they have persistence of their symptoms, persistence of the inflammation, then we'll have to increase the, either the dosage of the uh, topical steroid, consider adding systemic steroids, or perhaps a combination of both diet and topical steroids. There are some patients that have uh, more permanent and fixed strictures that we will then have to um, dilate uh, endoscopically on a regular basis. Well, I'm going to digress for just a moment and, and go back to this defining step, and that is the response to the proton pump inhibitor. So it was noted uh, in the mid-2000s uh, when all patients were placed on proton pump inhibitor therapy to assess for gastroesophageal reflux disease, that actually there was a large number of patients who were getting a good clinical response to proton pump inhibitor therapy, anywhere from 30 to 80 percent. So when they studied this, they found that indeed uh, this is a, a nice systematic review, uh, which shows in this forest plot here approximately 50 percent response rate to the proton pump inhibitor. Um, these patients were experiencing both symptomatic as well as histologic improvement. And one of the interesting things was that uh, in several of these studies, they had pH monitors uh, performed, and this did not predict a response to the proton pump inhibitor. So hinted that there was something there that was uh, more complex than just acid reflux. So this diagram shows this complex nature uh, interaction between GERD, EOE, and the PPI response. Of course, most esophageal symptoms that we hear of are probably related to gastroesophageal reflux disease. There are those patients that have the immunogenic eosinophilic esophagitis, and now we have defined this group that have PPI responsive EE. And what this likely represents is that there is some overlap with gastroesophageal reflux disease and eosinophilic esophagitis. Certainly an esophagus that uh, is inflamed with uh, EOE is probably not working well. These patients are more susceptible to gastroesophageal reflux. We also think that there may be some patients who have a mild form of EOE and that by just healing their epithelial barrier, they're able to prevent antigen exposure. And then lastly, there have been, been several labs in the country that have su suggested that the PPI actually has some anti-eosinophilic, anti-inflammatory properties that actually down-regulates the eotaxin-3. So I think at this point, uh, most of these patients that, uh, again, have the symptoms compatible with EOE, have the endoscopic appearance of EOE, but yet respond to the PPI it may be in continuum with uh, our true immunogenic uh, EOE patients, and this is perhaps just an early response. Well, as mentioned, when we have determined that our patients uh, are on immunogenic uh, EOE, then we will offer them first-line therapy, and that being either topical steroids or dietary therapy. 
So the two topical steroids that uh, have been used are fluticasone and budesonide. Um, the main difference between these two has been uh, the efficacy with which uh, they are applied. So budesonide, uh, we have patients mix up a one milligram, one milliliter liquid with uh, four teaspoons of Splenda and two teaspoons of water. And they mix this up and they make a syrupy concoction. Um, these patients will take it twice a day. Now, alternatively, fluticasone, which is easier to take because they take the inhaler and they try to coordinate it as if they swallow it. So again, easier to grab and go and put in your pocket, but unfortunately, when it comes to inhalers, it's difficult to deliver it to the esophagus because, of course, some of it is inhaled, some of it is in the mouth, and yet some of it gets swallowed. So I don't think it's been a, as effective of a formulation as the budesonide is in the liquid syrup form. It was mentioned the other first-line therapy is dietary management, and uh, Dr. Mather is going to uh, expand on this, but this was a nice uh, meta-analysis of the three diets that are offered to patients, uh, elemental diet, six-food elimination diet, and then allergy test-directed uh, elimination diet. And of course, elemental diets, you can see, is the most effective, but it's very difficult to be on an elemental diet, especially for adults. Um, Again, uh, this means going on a liquid uh, food supplement uh, with a, a amino acid basis. And again, not one that's palatable and not one that is, uh, uh, we've had good success with. Uh, the allergy test-directed diet, unfortunately, has had less than 50% response. So uh, most patients are offered a six-food elimination diet. And this is based on the six most common food triggers of eosinophilic esophagitis, removing those foods from their diet and then reintroducing them to see if we can determine what triggers their EOE. Again, a nice response of over 70%. So I just wanted to show the endoscopic images of a patient uh, that, four patients that were brought uh, through an, a six food elimination diet. And again, pre-diet, you can see that there are many features of eosinophilic esophagitis on the far left. And then once their food triggers have been identified, these have been removed from their diet, their endoscopy repeated, there has been improvement uh, in the middle column. And then when their food triggers have be, been reintroduced, you can see that, again, there are more features uh, of eosinophilic esophagitis on the right. Well, bringing patients through the six-food elimination diet protocol is quite a process. Uh, so first of all, we will uh, wean the patients off of their topical steroids because they need to be off of that so that we know whether uh, our diet is... Uh, going to be helpful with regards to ridding the inflammation. So once they're off the steroids, we will take them off all six food groups. We will repeat their endoscopy and get the biopsy and see if they've had uh, persistent uh, mucosal healing as well as uh, uh, resolved any residual eosinophilic uh, inflammation. If they have, then we will start working them through uh, the uh, reintroduction phase of the diet. So we will go one food group at a time, we will uh, introduce one at two weeks. If all goes well, we'll introduce the second food for another two weeks. And then we'll perform an endoscopy at week four. Now, there are some centers that will actually, um, purists, uh, we could say, I guess, that would repeat endoscopies with biopsies after each food group is reintroduced. But this, as you can imagine, is a lot of endoscopies when it's all said and done. So we generally will work through two food groups at a time until we get to the most allergenic of these foods, which are wheat and uh, dairy. And we will do those singly and then repeat the endoscopies after one month. So again, seven to eight endoscopies are required from when the, the patient presents with these uh, symptoms to when we work them through the six food elimination diet with reintroduction. As I mentioned, there are some patients uh, who have advanced disease uh, that have fibrostenotic uh, strictures and concentric rings. Now, these uh, are more permanent features of EOE, and these will need to be dilated endoscopically. So here in this cartoon, we just see a balloon that is uh, introduced through the endoscope, and we can safely increase uh, the diameter of the esophagus. We have a good response rate. 80% uh, have a response immediately. And this is somewhat durable in that this will last for a year to a year and a half. The problem is, of course, is that these dilations, although they increase the diameter of the esophagus, they don't resolve or prevent the inflammation that we uh, see in the esophagus. And then we want to 
uh, halt uh, so that there's no further fibrostenotic disease or luminal narrowing. So uh, Dr. Mather and I have spoken often with regards to you know, how we monitor our patients. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're unable to use symptoms as reliable endpoints. And this is, again, because the patients learn quickly if uh, certain food groups uh, cause dysphagia, so they avoid those foods and their swallowing is better. Um, surveys have shown that uh, these patient symptoms just don't correlate with what we see on endoscopy and on uh, histology. So the gold standard really remains that of endoscopy and uh, pathology with regards to our endpoints. And again, we're comparing reduction of eosinophils as well as those other features that I showed uh, that are found on mucosal biopsies. The problem is, of course, endoscopy is somewhat invasive. Uh, there is slight risks, and it's expensive to the patients. Sometimes insurance companies won't support uh, the uh, reintroduction endoscopies uh, of a six-food elimination diet. There's been interest, of course, in trying to find biomarkers. It would be so much easier if a patient to, uh, could just give a blood sample uh, when they're in the clinic. But unfortunately, uh, there have been no uh, biomarkers that have been proven to be uh, useful. Um, Dr. Mather is uh, going to go some of the, through some of the genetic testing as well, which uh, this, uh, unfortunately is not available clinically and has been more beneficial with making the diagnosis and less so in uh, working the patient through um, an elimination diet and reintroduction phase. So on this note, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Mather. <coughs> Okay, so I think uh, Dr. Gomnitz kind of already set the stage for why an allergist might be involved in eosinophilic esophagitis. And uh, so to kind of start things off, I just want to highlight that in this disorder, you have the presence of eosinophils in the tissue. And whenever you hear about eosinophils, especially in the developed uh, Western countries, you should be thinking about allergy. Globally and in third world nations, uh, you may want to be thinking about parasitic diseases, but certainly in more developed countries, as soon as you see eosinophils, you need to be thinking about some sort of an allergic disorder. So eosinophils are pathognomonic for allergic disease. And as Dr. Gomnitz mentioned, one thing that's been found routinely in series of uh, studies looking at eosinophilic esophagitis patients is that a great proportion of them have comorbid allergic disease. And it can be up to 80%, typically allergic rhinitis, and about half of them will have asthma, and there's also been some atopic dermatitis associated with it as well. And so these findings have really kind of led to this whole interest in this uh, field of trying to figure out, is there an allergy to foods? And there's pretty good evidence that there is some food sensitivity that's playing a role in this disease. And as Dr. Gaunitz had mentioned, there were studies, uh, especially done in children, where they used elemental diets. And this is a formula that's amino acid based and in children, it's very easy to put them on this type of a diet for an extended period of time. And they found that these kids would have significant symptom and histological improvement. But now what about in adults? And I think Dr. Gomnitz kind of told you a little bit about this, but there was a study uh, as an example that was published back in 2013 where they put adults on this elemental diet. Um, and as Dr. Gomnitz had also mentioned, this is very unpalatable. So it's an amino acid diet uh, in this particular study, they wanted patients to be on it for four weeks. There were 29 patients enrolled. Three of them, right off the bat, stopped the treatment on the first day. They just could not tolerate the taste. Eight more uh, left the study within that first two-week period. Of the remaining individuals in the study, it turned out that they did get a pretty good endoscopic response. So there was a pretty significant drop in the eosinophil count uh, in, the, in the esophagus. And for those that made it out to four weeks, they had an even, even greater improvement in the histology. Now, one of the challenges uh, in all of the eosinophilic esophagitis studies is that the symptom tools that we have to use right now are not directly geared towards eosinophilic esophagitis. So it's been a big challenge to demonstrate that there have been uh, symptomatic improvements in the, in the disease. And that was true in this particular study as well. So even though we saw all this great histological improvement, the scores that they were using to measure um, the symptoms in eosinophilic esophagitis did not change much. And uh, in hindsight now, we're thinking that it's mainly because 
the types of scoring tools we're using are not directed um, towards this, this disease specifically. So with the recognition that, especially in adult population, we're not going to be able to use an elemental diet in a sustained fashion, that's what kind of led to switching over to looking at a six-food elimination diet. And the six foods were chosen, as Dr. Gamas mentioned, because that these are the most allergenic uh, foods uh, that, that we encounter. And those include dairy, soy, wheat, egg, peanuts, and tree nuts, as well as fish and, and shellfish. So in the studies that use the six food elimination diet, and there have been several that have been done now, this has found to result in a significant uh, improvement in, um, in the patients, both on histology, and so what's seen in this panel is the proximal esophagus as well as the distal esophagus. And what you can see is the mean eosinophil counts in those tissues drop dramatically on the six food elimination diet. Uh, again, both in the proximal and distal esophagus. And in this particular study, the symptom tool that they used was also able to demonstrate that there was a symptomatic improvement. So, so this is definitely an approach uh, that in our field we're finding can be very effective for our EOE patients. And what has now also been um, done, as again Dr. Gown has mentioned, is that once we know that there's a responder to the avoidance of all six foods, we can now sequentially reintroduce foods because it's not going to be all six foods that are driving the disease. It may be just one or two of them. And by doing the sequential reintroduction, we can figure out exactly what it is that the patients need to avoid. Now, as we saw in that table from Dr. Gomnitz, identifying the food allergen takes a lot of effort. So it's multiple endoscopies, it's multiple periods of avoidance and reintroduction. And so this has been a, a big challenge, and in fact, there's been a lot of interest, certainly in the allergy world, to try and figure out, is there some other way for us to identify the food in a very simple fashion. And so one thing I do in my clinic routinely is skin prick testing uh, to food allergens as well as aeroallergens. And so there's been a great interest in doing this testing for foods and determining whether this may help us identify directly what foods need to be avoided. And so there have been efforts over a number of years to try and see whether this is actually beneficial. Multiple studies have been published, and in fact, even here at UW, we did a retrospective chart review of all of our uh, food allergen testing. And it turns out, with doing all of this type of testing, we have no evidence that our skin prick testing to food allergens is actually identifying foods to avoid for clinical benefit. So that was actually very disappointing, and it's something that uh, we're still trying to understand what are the mechanisms of interaction with the foods that might be driving the disease, and how can we uh, determine which of those foods are going to be causing it in some sort of a simple test. Now, one thing I should also confess, and this is a big discussion I have with our fellows, is that we still have a lot of patients coming to the allergy clinic, and Dr. Gomnitz has seen them. They have bona fide eosinophil esophagitis, and they have been told about the six-food elimination diet, but they don't want to go through all that effort. They don't want to avoid all six foods, and they want to know which foods to avoid. And so uh, they come to our allergy clinic wanting those, those answers. And as I told you, our data doesn't necessarily support doing that testing, uh, but this is where we have that whole conflict of art of medicine versus science of medicine. And what we have now started doing in our allergy clinic is we will go ahead and do that testing, fully letting the patient know that if we do find some positives, avoiding that may not necessarily help their disease, but it's certainly a place to start. And it's been surprising to me how many patients are completely willing to, to go with that sort of a pattern of, of management. So we'll do the testing. And often we will find, at about half the time, we will find something that uh, ends up being positive. And they'll usually use that information as a starting point for the elimination diet. So um, again, it's just a, a way for us to get some patient buy-in to go ahead and start doing this, this whole uh, elimination diet. So I don't know the exact numbers, but it's pretty high. And obviously in our population, as I was mentioning, we, I, we looked at our uh, retrospective data, and about 50% of the time we will find a positive test to, an, uh, to a food allergen in our EOE patients. Now that, you have to keep in mind, is supposed to be a test identifying IgE-mediated sensitivity. And so typically we would expect that an IgE-mediated sensitivity would result in perhaps anaphylactic reactions or much more severe 
allergic reactions to, to foods, and these folks don't have it. So yeah, to your point, it is actually a fairly high uh, false positive rate. So I'm going to turn my attention now to looking at some of the disease mechanisms evolved in uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. And uh, very early on, there were some big gun approaches used to try and identify uh, different pathways and different key genes and, and loci that might be involved in the disease. So these gene expression type of studies, the genome-wide association studies. And to start things off, there was a, a publication from 2007 which did a very nice study looking at the eosinophilic esophagitis transcriptome. So this is a figure that's a heat map of um, genes that are expressed in the eosinophilic esophagitis tissue, or I should say the esophageal tissue. Um, and each horizontal line represents an individual gene, and each vertical column represents an individual patient. So towards the left here, you have a number of patients that have normal esophagus, and you can see that they have a baseline expression of a number of these. These are hundreds of different genes that they looked at. And when you look at the eosinophilic esophagitis patients, there's a whole host of genes that are very significantly upregulated and a number of genes that are also downregulated in these eosinophilic esophagitis patients. And another interesting part with this particular study is that they also included patients that had eosinophilic esophagitis that were on treatment and had symptomatic improvement. And these are the folks that are represented all the way here on the right that were treated with topical fluticasone. And what you can see here is that there's actually a normalization of the gene expression. So there clearly is a set of uh, a, a gene signature or EOE uh, transcriptome that's very characteristic of this um, disease population. Now when they uh, analyzed the specific genes that were being upregulated and downregulated, there were patterns that really resembled what happens with IL-13 stimulation. So in that same paper, what they ended up doing is doing some in vitro stimulations of epithelial cells with IL-13, and that's represented here in, the, in these three sets of uh, right, right columns. And so when they did IL-13 stimulation, they found that you had a particular pattern of genes that were upregulated and downregulated. And then when you looked at actual patients that either had normal esophagus or eosinophilic esophagitis, um, that these patterns in the EOE patients actually resemble that IL-13 uh, IL stimulation. And this is one of the uh, studies that really kind of highlighted that IL-13 signaling may be an important part of the pathophysiology in eosinophilic esophagitis. And as you might imagine, with that knowledge, uh, this kind of led to a pilot study uh, of a clinical trial using an anti-IL-13 monoclonal antibody. And um, this particular study uh, treated the patients for, I want to say, somewhere around 50 to 60 days uh, with the anti-IL-13. And what you can see is that with treatment, uh, a number of these individuals had a pretty significant drop in the eosinophil counts in the esophageal tissue, uh, whereas in the placebo, you didn't see much of a, a consistent pattern. In addition, what's shown in this right panel is that with the treatment with anti-IL-13, you actually saw some changes in gene expression. So the genes that typically are upregulated with IL-13, when you use anti-IL-13, those genes went down in expression. And similarly, genes that are usually downregulated with IL-13 actually went up with uh, anti-IL-13 treatment. So based on uh, the eosinophil count as well as uh, the gene expression, this anti-IL-13 seems to be something that's uh, very beneficial. Uh, however, in this pilot study, they again also were looking at symptoms and we face that same dilemma as we do with many eosinophilic esophagitis uh, clinical trials. There were some symptoms that kind of showed some trends to improvement, uh, but it didn't show statistical significance. And again, this is uh, partially because we don't have great patient-related um, outcome instruments to use for eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, there's one that's now come out and is starting to be used, uh, but has yet to be used uh, extensively in clinical trials. So Dr. Gomnitz had also mentioned this whole notion of the PPI responsive esophageal eosinophilia, or uh, PPI-RE. Um, one thing that we have now found uh, with this particular disorder is that it does very much resemble eosinophilic esophagitis. So even though you have this PPI responsiveness, uh, if you pay attention to these two middle columns, when we actually look in the tissue and think about some of the uh, 
inflammatory mechanisms that might be going on, it actually has a lot of similarity to EOE. So this again is a heat map of gene expression in the esophageal tissue. And you can see that in the EOE patients, you've got this characteristic pa pattern of some blue and red uh, indicating the lower expressed and more highly expressed genes. And that very much resembles uh, the PPI uh, re patients. And when these particular patients are then put on a PPI treatment, you have a change in the gene expression, which now goes back and resembles more of normal uh, esophageal uh, tissue. And interestingly, with these particular genes that are being examined, you can look at patients with traditional GERD, and they will actually have the same pattern as the normal patients. So this is a subset of genes that actually is a good marker for eosinophilic esophagitis, and it turns out the PPI responsive uh, EE has that same genetic signature. So I'm going to turn my attention to the, the genome-wide association studies. And this has actually been done on a few occasions with eosinophilic esophagitis patients. Some of the early studies identified genes that were already known, uh, known about in allergic disorders, such as asthma. So there weren't any new uh, pieces of information coming out from some of the early studies. Now, this is one that was published in uh, 2014 and was really notable because there were two genes that came out in this particular study uh, that hadn't been uh, identified in other uh, uh, studies of allergic diseases. The one up on the right, the ANK, uh, RD27, that's a gene that has to do with melanin uh, production and, and transport, so not exactly clear uh, how that's directly related to eosinophilic esophagitis. But this other one, the CAPN14, actually represents uh, calpain 14 and this was a very exciting finding because it kind of fits very much with uh, some of our understanding of eosinophilic esophagitis, and particularly this notion that in EOE, we've got uh, this whole barrier dysfunction going on. And uh, this is actually a concept that is running through a number of different allergic diseases, including atopic dermatitis and asthma. And it's this whole notion that the epithelial uh, surface may be disrupted and allowing exposure to allergens and other irritants in the environment. So with the finding of calpain 14 we now realize that there is this whole model, which is uh, uh, depicted here in this top half of the figure, where IL-13 and calpain are contributing to barrier dysfunction. And one of the key genes where these two things are linked is desmoglein. And desmoglein is one of these proteins that's involved in some of the tight junctions between uh, epithelial cells. So with IL-13, desmoglein is something that actually gets downregulated, and IL-13 will upregulate the expression of calpain-14, and this calpain-14 is actually a, uh, it's a protease, and so this protease actually can degrade portions of desmoglein and then reduce its activity. So both of these uh, signals are contributing to some of, the, some of the barrier dysfunction. And what I'm showing here in the left panel is just a demonstration that indeed in our eosinophilic esophagitis patients, when you look at the gene expression of calpain-14 in the esophageal tissue, it is significantly increased when compared to uh, control subjects. So this barrier dysfunction does seem to be playing a big role in eosinophilic esophagitis. Now the other big uh, inflammatory feature that's a part of eosinophilic esophagitis is, is a fibrosis uh, signature. And that's kind of depicted here in a, in a paper that was published back in 2010. And uh, there have actually been a number of studies that have uh, demonstrated the, the presence of fibrosis. And in this particular one, they took patients that had been treated with topical steroids and found that there were some folks that had uh, a response to treatment and others that didn't. And so they split them up into responders and non-responders. And as you can see with the responders, when you look at the eosinophil count in the, in the tissue, that was significantly uh, decreased. And the non-responders did not have much of a, of a change. And something that corresponded with these findings was the fibrotic signature. So they looked at TGF-beta as well as uh, SMAD signaling. So this is phosphosmad uh, 2 and 3. And these things uh, followed the same pattern, where responders would have decrease in TGF-beta and phosphosmad uh, signaling, whereas the non-responders didn't have much of a change. So the fibrotic signature and fibrotic signaling that's happening in the, in the airway is also a key feature in eosinophilic esophagitis.
All right, so I kind of want to turn my attention to, to some of the big challenges that we continue to face in eosinophilic esophagitis. And as Dr. Gomez mentioned, this is still a relatively new disorder. We're learning a lot more about it all the time. And one of the big issues that we're facing is what do we do about the role of foods? Uh, how do we understand this? Uh, is it truly some sort of allergy that we're just not testing in an appropriate way? Is it just a nonspecific irritant response to some of these foods? Uh, and regardless of what that mechanism is, how are we going to identify what foods uh, that our patients should avoid? And the other big uh, challenge we face in this disorder is monitoring disease activity. And we want to be able to do this in a very easy fashion. So not something where we have to go through numerous uh, cycles of endoscopies, because uh, that's not something a lot of patients are super, super excited to do. These endoscopies are obviously invasive and, and costly. Um, we certainly have looked at some symptom tools, but one of the challenges there ends up being that it doesn't always correlate with uh, some of the biopsy results. So there can definitely be a disconnect between disease activity we're seeing in the tissue and uh, patient symptoms. And so this has really led to interest in biomarkers. Are there going to be some other feature or some other serum or other type of biomarker that can help us track disease activity? Um, this is a slide that kind of depicts what the eosinophil actually has to go through in order to end up in the esophageal tissue. Uh, and this was a figure that I actually put together by uh, one of the individuals here in the Department of Medicine who's been doing a lot of work on uh, eosinophil biology. So Mats Johansson put together this figure that demonstrates that eosinophils, when they're freely circulating uh, in the peripheral circulation, have a number of surface markers that are in an inactive state. And once they encounter some sort of signaling such as IL-5, and eosinophilic esophagitis is probably eotaxin-3, there can be an activation, or at least a partial activation, of the eosinophil such that some of the uh, adhesion molecules, some of these integrins, may now become activated and will bind to the surface of the endothelium. And that's kind of your first step of now getting it transported into tissue and more fully activated. So there's this recognition that if we sort of look at the surface of the eosinophil, we will get a sense of how activated uh, it is and how much it may be able to contribute to uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. So this notion was examined to some extent um, in this paper that was published back in 2011. Uh, this research group basically looked at a whole host of surface markers on the eosinophils as well as a lot of serum markers. And what they wanted to do was figure out whether the patterns of uh, these different uh, markers on the surface of the eosinophil and the serum could help segregate uh, different patient populations. And in this particular figure, they're showing healthy controls, patients with ulcerative colitis, and eosinophilic esophagitis. And I don't know the, exactly the details of it, but they did some pretty sophisticated statistical analyses of the signals from all those different markers to basically come up with two uh, domains. And by looking at these two domains, you can actually get a separation of the eosinophilic esophagitis patients the healthy controls, and the patients with ulcerative colitis. So suggesting that there is a pattern of expression uh, on the surface of the, of the eosinophils that can help um, us identify this group. They also uh, repeated this analysis um, with a different set of markers. And this, in this particular analysis, most of the markers ended up being uh, serum proteins. But by looking at this uh, combination of different uh, biomarkers, they were now able to separate out healthy controls, people with allergy or asthma, and eosinophilic esophagitis. Not as clean a separation as the previous one, but you can see we've got the EOE patients up here, the folks with allergy here, and the healthy controls uh, over here. So these figures really kind of help support this notion that, you know, we may actually be able to find some biomarkers uh, that can help us uh, really track these, these patients. Um, what I just showed you were data to help sort out these different populations of individuals. But the big open question is, can we use these biomarkers to actually uh, follow disease activity? And we actually have an example from uh, all the work we've been doing in our division in asthma. Again, this is a study that was uh, published by Mats Johansson, where he focused on a single uh, biomarker on the surface of eosinophils. And in this particular study, we took asthma patients and focused on that particular beta-1 uh, integrin. And he actually has an antibody that's able to specifically recognize the activated state of this integrin. 
And when we look at patients before they were allergen challenged, uh, we have a baseline signal of beta-1 activation, and that's shown in this green line here. And then after they were challenged with allergen, so now getting activation of the eosinophils that are going to end up going into the lung, we can then see by the blue line that you have an increase in the levels of that beta-1 integrin activation. So this is actually something that can serve as a, as a marker um, for increased activation of uh, eosinophils. And so uh, basically with all the uh, clinic uh, patients that Dr. Gomnitz and I have been sharing uh, and with our expertise on the eosinophil uh, uh, surface markers, this led to the uh, preparation of an R21 proposal that got funded last year. And so Dr. Gomnitz and I are now basically looking uh, at whether we can uh, determine that whether the eosinophil activation that's measured by this beta-1 integrin activation can help us uh, track disease activity. And we're uh, measuring disease activity by looking at the esophageal eosinophil count, looking at histology, looking at endoscopic appearance, and, uh, and symptoms. And we want to see whether this might be, be able to help us uh, define a biomarker uh, for this disease. And we've got a couple aims here, basically to look at uh, how these biomarkers uh, not only beta-1 integrin, but we're also looking at a number of other uh, markers as well, uh, track with uh, disease activity at one time point, and then we're also looking at how these things track with treatment and changes in uh, disease activity as well as these biomarkers. All right, I know our time is basically almost up, so I'm going to end right there. Thank you very much, Dr. Mather. Let me have you and Dr. Gomez come up to take maybe one okay. or two questions. I'll ask you right. to call on the audience. Okay, Molly? Yeah, so I was struck, of course, by the um, male prevalence. Um, yeah. Is there an influence of sex on gene expression? That I'm not aware of. Um, Three times more common in women than women. What about yeah. the cellular yeah. level? Yeah, yeah. No, I, d I don't think that's actually been, been looked at. So, so I'll address the, the microbiome stuff. That's, I know, an area that's of, of great interest, and I don't think any of that data has been published yet, but there are definitely individuals that are uh, very much interested in, in looking at that. And I think you're absolutely right about uh, the, uh, you know, the, basically the acidity causing barrier dysfunction. And you know, with 80% of these folks already having other allergic diseases, they just may be predisposed to having that sort of, uh, those pathways activated in the, in the tissue. So that may well be uh, the mechanism for the, this disorder. So that's been looked at. Um, and interestingly, it does not work very well. So it can get rid of some of the esophageal eosinophilic inflammation, but in terms of uh, benefits for uh, symptoms and, and disease, other disease activity, it hasn't been great. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, is there any role for anti-IL-5 uh, treatment in eosinophilic esophagitis? And it turns out that has been tried and not found to be very effective. And with that, we're going to have to close. I want to thank Dr. Gomnitz and Dr. Mather for an excellent grand round.